Um, so to notice, we call up uh, H.R. 1631, the Protecting and Enhancing Public Access to Codes Act for purposes of markup and move that the committee reported favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 1631. Without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I come by this, uh, this bill honestly. Mr. Deutsch and I... Uh, with him as the lead, introduced it in the last Congress and uh, wasn't able to uh, be marked up and made law. But so it comes again, but it doesn't come again because we can wait forever. It comes because there is a clear need to strike a balance between copyrighted material that ends up being uh, in codes uh, or in laws, if you will, of the United States and the rights of the copyright holder. Clearly, we understand that if you must have information in order to comply with regulations slash laws, and the best example, of course, would be fire codes and building codes, uh, we have to make sure you have access, and under H.R. 1631, you will have access to all of this information for free. On the other hand, there's a considerable amount of cost that these standard uh, organizations, uh, often nonprofits, and others put into preparing and uh, making available this information. They often do so in a form that is well worth a small price that is paid for either a printed book or an organized search capability. So what the bill does is it requires that this information be fully available to any and all. However, if you want to use it for commercial purposes and you want to have the advantages, uh, then you can pay a fee. This strikes a balance where, for example, the homeowner wanting to comply with fire laws or building laws in their building can simply go online and make themselves available of all of this. On the other hand, the contractor who wants to take a series of books out to the site or have his notebook have a full copy of it to be able to refer to at any time would certainly and has historically been willing to pay a fee for it. This has had some uh, history of court uh, problems, but mostly it is an example of where my subcommittee looks to find ways to strike a balance to encourage and promote the useful copyrights in this case, these works, while recognizing that the public, when it is an essential piece of information, has a right. I have coined the phrase for this and others as standard essential copyright. And similar to standard essential patents, you do not always get the ability to have something free just because it's in a standard, but you cannot and should not be denied access to it. That is exactly what this bill does. It is non-controversial, and I'm proud to say it is equally bipartisan with more than 10 members of this committee, more than five on each side, co-sponsoring it. Uh, I do understand that there may be amendments offered. I haven't seen them and was quite surprised to find that there might be. We're certainly willing to look at and consider and enhance the bill. But make, let there be no doubt, if we do nothing we are certainly continuing a situation in which both sides are by definition unhappy and our courts may continue to consider uh, alternatives, but those alternatives do not strike the constitutional balance that we are mandated to do so. So I'm thrilled that uh, this committee has come together on this uh, bipartisan uh, legislation and would hope that uh, we could get it out of committee today and continue to move it through its process. And with that, I thank the chairman and yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Nadler, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the Pro Codes Act is sensible bipartisan legislation that strikes a balance between copyright protection and public access to information. Sensible, sensible and bipartisan are not words that people often associate with Congress these days, but the Pro Codes Act fits that bill. Standards Development Organizations, or SDOs, are organizations that develop and publish standards to govern certain highly technical industries. These best practices govern everything from consumer safety and household utility installation 
to home electrical, wiring, and plumbing planning. SDOs make sure that your house won't catch on fire, your plumbing is up to code, your water boiler is installed correctly, and everything in between. You rely on your local contractor, and your contractor relies on their SDO standards. Very often, state and local legislatures, which generally do not have the requisite experts on staff to write highly technical standards, choose to incorporate SDO developed standards by reference into the law. When SDOs come together to set these basic rules of the road for their industries, they are naturally entitled to a copyright for the content that they produce. And in cases in which a local, state, or federal legislature wishes to adopt that content into their laws, they should, that should not mean that these copyright protections just go away. SDOs fund their work by selling their copyrighted material to other experts who can use it to make the necessary evaluations, repairs, installations, and the like. With this rigorous development and dedication to constant improvement, it is no wonder that states and localities want to adopt these codes by reference into the law. The only problem is, if you can't find the code, you don't know how it will affect you. And Americans have an essential interest in knowing that they can access the laws that govern them. So we find ourselves in a dilemma. Once the code is enacted into law, Americans must have access to this information. On the other hand, SDOs fund their work, which we rely on to keep us safe, through sale of their copyrighted works. If the reward for writing high quality industry standards is to have your copyright taken away, this will undoubtedly have a chilling effect on innovation in these fields, and we also have an interest in ensuring that these codes always reflect the highest possible standards. The Pro Codes Act seeks to find the middle ground between these two competing interests. This legislation would allow SDOs to retain their copyrights when their standards are incorporated by reference into the law, so long as they make a copy available online at no cost. Under the bill, they could still put their code in a book or an easy-to-use app and sell those products to their members and related companies. This would ensure that it is still financially viable to continue to innovate and to update and develop these codes. But at the same time, the standards would have to be made available online for all the world to see. There could be print controls and copy controls, but the law would still be publicly accessible. As I said at the outset, this is a sensible bill that would help trade associations, the American public, and our innovation system. And I appreciate Mr. Issa and Ms. Ross for introducing this legislation in a bipartisan fashion. But I must note that there has been no hearing and no process on this bill before today's markup. Legislation on a complex subject like copyright that affects so many industries within the standard-setting community and that must be balanced with a strong public interest would benefit from greater stakeholder input and greater deliberation. While I will be supporting the bill today, I hope that there will be an opportunity to further refine it before it advances further through the legislative process. In particular, I want to call the committee's attention to a letter we received yesterday from the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers, the American Welding Society, and the National Board of Boiler and Pressure Vessel Inspectors. These are organizations that support the intent of this legislation but may require a handful of technical corrections before this new standards regime can work for them. There is certainly room to accommodate these concerns on the way to the floor, and I ask unanimous consent that this letter be made a part of the record. Without objection. With that being said, I urge members to support the bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I've listened to um, the bill's sponsor and the ranking member uh, trying to to listen very carefully. And I'm left with a couple of questions, and I think maybe the California re representative might be able to answer. Number one is, what is the problem this bill is trying to fix? Number two, um, what is the impact uh, of what where this is going? And number three, as a former state legislator, I'm trying to understand uh, what impact you will have on state legislatures that actually do look at these these um, standards that are uh, and incorporate those into their statutes? And so I'd like to know the answers to those three questions, please. If the gentleman would yield. Uh, the gentleman has very apt questions, and, and this is something that I'm glad he asked. Uh, first of all, if uh, if 
standard, if copyrights are put into standards and no copyright protection occurs, and, and some, some cities and states have felt that it's that way, then what you end up with is third parties taking the copyrighted material and monetizing it uh, with no benefit to the copyright holder or uh, simply rampant uh, uh, production of it, which eliminates any ability to charge. If you can, lose- Can I ask you a question on that point? Are, are you saying then that if the state legislature incorporates by reference, which by quite frankly, all of these these organizations bring their stat, they bring their proposed standards to us when I was in the state legislature. They begged us to adopt those standards. Are you saying then that the legislature then, in order to protect their copyright, we have to pay royalties or? Well, it, what, what, what is that about? You're, no, you're exactly right. We, the, the, clearly, we want to make sure that the material is available royalty free. But as you can imagine, the legislatures, and state legislatures are exactly where this happens, uh, they make a decision to either research and pass their own legislation, and complex legislation such as what the standards should be for boilers or fire codes and so on, would, would not occur easily at the legislative level. The expertise doesn't exist that way. Paying an organization to develop it for you and then owning it by the state would be a cost to the state. Instead, these not-for-profit organizations uh, use the revenue they receive from those who buy their books and so on to help offset their cost of their members producing these standards. It is an example of a public-private relationship. It is well established, it's been around since before you and I were born. What we're trying to do is make sure that in all cases, the public has a right and an ability to go online see the information, know what it is, while preserving the ability for these not-for-profits to gain the revenue through their sales that allow them, uh, normally to architects and professionals and so on, uh, that allow them to have a revenue that offsets their cost. And, and again, their costs tend to be very small compared to what a legislature would have. And in looking at this, and many of those who asked for some time to make technical corrections are exactly the organizations that in a not-for-profit situation are creating the standards that legislatures then adopt rather than trying to reinvent. So, uh, reclaiming my time, in my experience, um, these standards that come to the state legislatures, um, they, they seek, these, these organizations seek actual nationwide adoption. So Arizona and California, they want us all to be on the same page. Um, and so they bring them to us. Um, and, and I don't know of a single legislature that's actually out there saying, we're gonna bring in experts and develop our own. They're, they're relying on these. Um, am I, okay, we get back to my original question. What is the problem? And if I understand what you just said is that Somehow, if the state adopts and incorporates by reference or uh, puts it into their code in and of itself, that somehow that eats away at the copyright well, what of, happened, of, of, of the producers? Is that if, what you're yeah, If the gentleman would yield. If, if we strip away the copyright, then they get no revenue. If, who's, who's stripping away the copyright, sir? Well, this is the position of many individuals who say, Quite frankly, um, you're passing a law, but you're denying me the free access to read and comply with the law. There is an inherent right for someone to be able to, at no cost, be able to see the law. Right. And in the old days, we might have said, well, there's a copy in every library. Today, we effectively say, no, it's got to be available online in a way in which the public can access it. That's what this bill seeks to do. Now, if I can, the, the history is that these organizations were formed at the behest, quite frankly, of legislatures to do it, to create it. As in an ongoing basis for us in, in state and federal legislatures, of course there's a, a dialogue of, oh, here's the newest update, here's something. But that's decades or even a century after these organizations began producing them. The questioning of their copyright has come where we're trying to strike that balance. Clearly, if they get no revenue, they will go out of business and will be forced to try to make laws over which we don't know. On the other hand, if the public is denied free access to, uh, to see the law, 
then they're not given an opportunity to obey the law, but rather being forced to pay to obey. And, and that would be wrong, too. I, I thank the gentleman. Time Chairman. the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized, and then we'll come to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to co-lead this bill alongside Representative Issa, continuing our bipartisan work on patent and court issues that we began last Congress. And we had a good law we got passed last Congress through, excuse me, through this committee. The Pro Codes Act is a common sense solution that balances providing free public access to codes and standards that have been in, uh, incorporated into law while ensuring that important code development work can continue. And Mr. Biggs, at, at the end of my comments, I'm going to try to answer um, one of your questions. The industry codes and standards that keep us healthy and safe every day are created by Standards Development Organizations, or SDOs, which regularly convene experts to write and modify standards and ensure electrical codes, building codes, crisis management codes, and more are up to date. Importantly, the standards that SDOs put out are approved by consensus and adopted by industries voluntarily. However, Congress and federal agencies have recognized repeatedly that governments should rely on these standards whenever possible, which has led to their incorporation into law, including state law. I firmly believe that codes that, that have been incorporated to law, into law should be available to the public at no cost, as Mr. Issa um, has represented, and these would be available online for free. That's why this bill requires the codes be available online, which is not the current law. That said, code development requires revenue. And SDOs cannot operate without funding. And they earn that funding by maintaining copyrights to their codes as works of original authorship, which allows them to sell print copies and subscription access to the codes to fund code development at no cost to taxpayers. These purchased formats are typically used by builders, electricians, and other professionals who regularly refer to these codes in their line of work and do not want to rely on the read-only web page. Ultimately, this bill strikes a critical balance between enabling public access to codes incorporated into law and ensuring copyrights are protected and able to provide revenue to organizations that create and update the standards we need to stay safe and healthy. And I hope, Mr. Biggs, that that answers your question, that this would, you know, you could put a link into a legislator, legislature's website or uh, state law that just goes to the read-only code, so anybody can see it at any time for free. The legislature doesn't have to pay for it. It's other forms that would cost money. And then finally, um, some of the issues that have come up have come up in the last 24 to 48 hours. I want um, folks on both, side of, both sides of the aisle to know that um, we stand ready to work with Congressman Issa and any others to make any necessary technical changes to this bill, either in the Rules Committee or as it comes to the floor, we have no intention of leaving stakeholders out. And with would, that, would Mr. My, Chairman, would, would I my colleague leave, would, the, would my colleague yield for a question? Yes, uh, colleague from North Carolina. So, uh, you know, I think of the situation, for example, the North Carolina Building Code is raw. So, it's incorporated by reference. It is a code that's promulgated by the International Codes Conference, I think. And if I were to go look at any other law. I could go to the General Assembly's website in North Carolina. I could search the code. Uh, I could pull up the, the law. I could copy and paste off of that. I notice if I go to the International Codes Conference website, I can read the, the portions of the North Carolina Building Code as this example, but I can't, I can't copy off of it and paste. I cannot search it. That is all premium content you'd have to subscribe for. I don't know if these things vary, but I, when you say reasonable access, this law doesn't really seem to define that, except it's read-only access, it appears to me, meaning that you can do what I just described. 
different than what I could do on the website of the General Assembly. I can't copy, I can't search for words or terms. Is that correct? And is that what the balance is that's struck by this bill? So the balance is that it would be, it would be required to be free in this read-only format. The, com the complicated thing here is that we in Congress and state legislators do not want to fund the development of these codes. Yeah, I understand that. And these codes do have a copyright. And so if the people who develop it cannot get any revenue for doing that, but have to provide it for free, then they absorb Easy. the cost of that. Um, and I, I will also uh, yield to Congressman Issa if he wants to add anything to that. But that is, that is the problem we are trying to solve with this bill, creating that balance. Mr. Chairman? If the gentlelady's time has expired, we'll go to uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin and then to the gentlelady from California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm proud to co-sponsor my colleague, Mr. Rice's bill, H.R. 1631, the Pro Codes Act, uh, and I hope that we would pass it today. When folks across my state uh, go to bed tonight, they feel protected from electrical and fire hazards because of standards developed by experts across these fields. These standard uh, development organizations, or the SDOs, convene experts across industry to develop and publish a variety of technical and other important safety standards for use by both the public and private sector uh, at no cost to taxpayers. However, federal courts have endangered these organizations' copyright protections by ruling that SDOs lose the benefit of copyright for their safety standards when they are incorporated by reference into law by federal, state, and local governments. This puts public use of these important standards in jeopardy. H.R. 1631 makes a small but important clarification by stating that SDOs retain copyright protection when a standard is incorporated into law or regulation provided that the standard is available for free viewing on a publicly accessible website. Uh, the bill strikes a balance between the needs of the public and the needs of the copyright owner. And importantly, this bill does not preclude SDOs from licensing copyrights on their standards, which are necessary to support the organization's standard development activities. Uh, I want to thank the gentleman from California for introducing the bill, and I urge its passage, and I yield Would back. the gentleman yield for a moment? I do. Thank you. Um, you know, the, the gentleman makes a, a wonderful case of, of, of the balance that we struck. And I might note, because there seems to be some confusion, that standard setting uh, for example, the industry I came from, the electronics industry, every one of us that has used a Wi-Fi uh, port or has ever uh, had a DVD or even streams today, those are standards. Those standards, uh, such as the ones that the FCC uh, adopts, those standards are codified in law. And in fact, we look at, for example, the Wi-Fi and say, well, we're using it for free, isn't this great? We are, but those who make the products pay a standard essential patent license for often many, many, many patents that go into them. So again, that's an, a similar example where we realize that we have to reward those who innovate, who create something, and while at the same time providing for the common good. This is a very similar uh, balance, a balance between rewarding those who created the content but not penalizing those who use it, and that's exactly the same way. These individuals' copyrights, when incorporated, whether by their choice or not, will in fact lose part of their, uh, their normal copyright protection. But uh, the example given earlier of cut and paste is a good example. Limited cut and paste probably wouldn't be a problem and, and could potentially be incorporated, but let's understand printing a book or taking the, downloading the entire uh, uh, content is not something you get to do without go, in law without going to LexisNexis or some other search engine. So even there, even in other laws that the gentleman mentioned, uh, we do see that there are people generating revenue and once they create that database or that search engine, they expect to be compensated. So hopefully, uh, and I appreciate the gentleman co-sponsoring it and understanding it so well. Hopefully this will be an example where 
there may be technical corrections. I know the chairman is perfectly willing to not have this go to the floor without both sides weighing in on uh, final technical corrections. But hopefully we all understand that striking the balance as we do in st standard essential patents in these uh, copyrights is important for the continued production of this kind of material, which currently occurs at no cost to the governments that often adopt them. Would and the I thank the gentleman. Would the gentleman yield for a question? Yield? Would the gentleman yield for a question before yielding back? Mr. Eisen? Sir, of course. I'd love to hear it. it, it Mr. Mr. Fitzgerald. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Mr. Fitzgerald, thank you. Maybe the question goes to Mr. Eisen. Do, does this statute respond to some new case? That's one. That I, does it overrule some significant decision in law that, that would? Because I know this has been an issue for a long time. Uh, for example, as a lawyer from earlier in my career, I can remember that there was litigation like Westlaw is the big, is the big, now it wasn't even electronic at the time. I thought, well, it was, you get, but they would publish law and then there were cases over whether that could be copyrighted. But, and then they said the editorial enhancements could be, but not the law. Is there some new decision that this overrules? There are a number of, of cases, uh, in, and of course they vary from state to state, where there's copy and paste going on, where uh, these SDOs are litigating, sometimes winning, sometimes losing, and we'd like to create a single predictable standard for both sides. So yes, there have been a number of them, and of course they're occurring at the state level, and we want to we want to have a harmonized one because it is our responsibility. I appreciate the gentleman. I thank the gentleman from Wisconsin for yielding to both of us. Yield back. Mr. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from California is recognized. I'm going to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. I strongly object uh, to this bill. Um, it runs counter to longstanding Supreme Court precedent that recognizes that all citizens should have free access to the content of the law. And it also poses, I think, serious constitutional concerns that have recently been noted by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, permitting private ownership of standards that are essential to understanding one's legal obligations. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put into the record an article, Bill in Congress would bar Americans from deciding our own laws. Um, no objection. Starting with um, the case of Wheaton versus Peters in 1834, when the Supreme Court uh, decided uh, that no one uh, could copyright a court decision, there's a long line of decisions that you can't copyright the law itself. Um, most recently, uh, in a case in the uh, DC Circuit, American Society for Testing versus Public Resources Organization, they said this, a serious constitutional concern with permitting private ownership of standards essentials to understanding legal obligations, uh, as a matter of common sense, access to the law cannot be conditioned on the consent of a private party. Uh, that was uh, confirmed uh, by the Supreme Court uh, when Justice uh, Roberts affirmed saying no one can own the law. Now, this uh, bill would overturn those legal decisions that were that are recent ones, uh, barring citizens from reading and I would say also disseminating um, laws without a license is is completely contrary to the to our concept of of law where citizens own the law that we make, not some private entity. Now I understand that the uh, chairman thinks that this has been. Uh, satisfactorily resolved by allowing people to view a web page. That is insufficient. If we want robust debate, and in order to do that for people to argue uh, about standards, you have to be able to disseminate them, to uh, argue about them, to critique them, uh, not just to a view only. And I would note also that some of these standard uh, organizations uh, having been pressed by the courts to make this information available, are now doing it, allowing it only if you give up your private org information, you register with them, you give them their data. Never in the history of this country have we required citizens to give up their personal data in order to look at, understand, and argue about the law. This is a complete departure from the history that we have in our proud country. I would note, uh, and I would ask the unanimous consent that the amicus brief that I wrote 
and filed with the uh, District of Columbia Circuit Court be yeah, made a part of this actually. record. In that brief, I note that our own laws, our Open uh, Government Data Act, requires not only that it be open, but that it be uh, shareable, that it be machine readable, um, so that the citizens can have complete access to government information. And I think that standard that we have placed to all federal agencies about information uh, should not be, should not uh, be denied uh, people seeking access to, to the laws that are incorporated uh, by reference. I would ask unanimous consent that we uh, Would the gentlelady uh, mention right who, who submitted, who wrote that brief? I, I submitted the brief with the help, as we always get, um, from outside lawyers. Um, in this case, Jeff Perlman, uh, the Intellectual Property and Technology Law Clinic from the USC Gould School of Law. Um, I would note that we won this case, uh, that, that the law is free today. This bill, which I wish we'd had a hearing about it because I could have made my objections known at that time, this overturns uh, not only the recent win for, um, for, for freedom, for access to the law, but it was, is contrary to the entire history of the United States that allows citizens access to the law, to own it, to disseminate it, to argue about it, uh, and by giving the ownership of the law to a private party, it's completely contrary. But going back to my unanimous consent request, it's a letter uh, sent by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Public Citizen, Public Knowledge, Demand Progress, uh, the Internet Archive, Library Futures, the Authors Alliance, and several others uh, with a memorandum outlining uh, the serious problems with this bill. I see my time has expired, so I will yield back, but I, I have you. a series of amendments that I will offer to try and fix this. Uh, gentlelady's time has expired. The gentleman from, I think the order was Mr. Bishop from North Carolina. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope to ask a, a series of questions. And, and I'm, uh, I will tell you that this coming to this hearing on this, uh, on this markup on this bill, I've been troubled because I've had uh, some advice to be concerned about it. I've had I've, I'm familiar with it from my own legal practice over time, but I'm not an expert on the on the law uh, that Ms. Lofgren cites, and I, I want to make sure I understand it completely. I, I also say I tend to be sort of in the middle of the road on this. I do think um, standard-setting organizations uh, ought to be able to operate as they do to formulate standards. Those ought to be able to be incorporated into law. There ought to be reasonable access to them for people who are not practitioners, uh, but I've, but it is it has always been true that there are editorial enhancements and sophisticated functionality and Lexis and Westlaw as examples that can be copyrighted even though the law cannot. Correct. And I think the question that, uh, is what is the right level of access? And so I'm uh, I'm taken in part by uh, Ms. Lofgren's argument just now, uh, but I'm not sure what constitutes going too far. I. Um, I, it seems to me, and perhaps I'll, I'll ask the gentlelady, or yield to the gentlelady in a second if I can formulate this to see what the problem is in her view, but what, if the, if the information is available on a website, and again, the problem I have is the one I've just happened to pick out as International Codes Council, uh, they've got it set up so that you, and, and frankly, the, the costs, I will say, are quite modest to, to get a subscription even to their further access, but you can go and look at it. It seems like you ought to be able to function like a normal web page, ought to be able to take, you know, cut and, cut and paste information from it, ought to be able to do a basic search. But, you know, more advanced stuff, if there are annotations of cases, if there are, uh, if there's editorial content like headnote systems that we're familiar with from legal cases, all of that ought to be copyrighted, it seems, copyrightable. And, uh, I, and, 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 it, and it provides a value for people to be, have an incentive to produce it. Uh, for the purpose of advancement of, of the, whatever the, the art in question is. So I'd yield to the gentlelady from California if she would care to speak on that a moment. I'm trying to get better clarity. Uh, I thank you. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Yes, um, you know, these standard-setting organizations, many of them produce manuals uh, that help people comply with it. That's copyrightable. That's not the law. That's helping. It's similar to LexisNexis. I mean, you can't copyright the, the decisions 
but you can copyright the critique of the decisions, or uh, it's the same thing. W the problem here is that you go to a website, let's say uh, you're a civil libertarian and you disagree with part of a building standards. Um, you should be able to copy that, to publish it, to have uh, discussions with others of like mind uh, about that. You can't limit debate and understanding but, but of the, the law. The, the, you, know, you know, I'm trying to narrow it. I if you could, I mean, if, you, if I can give a link to the website where the whole code can be read, how, how, is, that, how is it better to copy it and distribute it? Well, there's, we've never allowed a private party to own the law. I understand the, and, the issue, the basic issue there. Uh, let, me, let me ask, I, my colleague from North Carolina is sort of uh, shaking her head, so uh, I see all the dissension on the Democratic side I can create. I'd just like to yield to the gentlelady from North Carolina to see if she could get at what I'm trying to ask. So, first of all, I want to express no, kidding, my obviously. great respect for, um, for my colleague, Representative Lofgren, um, she is a brilliant legal mind, and I hate to ever disagree with her. <laughs> I but, don't mind that. But much. I will say this, and um, the question is, how did this code come into being in the first place? And private parties created this code. So it's not like when you go to court and you're in, and there's an open court sy system. I agree. So here, with private you. parties have created it. And some states have adopted it, or the federal government has adopted it. And the federal government is not compensating that private so, party for it. Right. The, in this case, the private party would make right. it available for free. Let me, so let me reclaim sense, my time, because here- In a certain sense, it's a taking. I get it, and, and I sort of agree with that. Uh, I also sort of agree with uh, Representative Lofgren. I think the question is, what is the correct balance? Mm. I, I think you ought to have access that is similar to uh, what you'd expect on a conventional web page. You probably ought to be able to search it, basically. You probably ought to be able to copy and paste some of it. Uh, otherwise, I, I don't see the problem. But I, and so I'm out of time. Thank you. I, well, not quite, but 10 seconds. Let me just say this. I just think, I'm not sure the bill strikes the right balance as it is. I think it might be, need to be modified a bit, but at least in my view, I don't take the extreme view on either side. I think there are public interest <laughs> concerns, freedom concerns, uh, but I think you ought to have some ability to have a private standard setting body uh, you know, compensated in effect for that function, as the gentlelady from North Carolina says, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, I think we have Ms. Jackson Lee, then Mr. Ivey. Ms. Jackson Lee. I, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I asked to uh, strike the last word. Yeah, we will, but I'm just, excuse me, I'm sorry. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you so very much. I would say to Mr. Bishop of North Carolina, you have not uh, created dissension on this side of the aisle. You have simply created an, an, an uplifting of mutual respect for all of the members on this side of the aisle. We engage respectfully uh, with each other. Uh, but let me, um, let me uh, try to um, um, ascertain or to establish, ascertain the, uh, the reasoning and then establish um, my basis for uh, recognizing uh, this legislation. As I say that, I always believe um, that my friends are correct, that hearings are always a preferable approach than a direct ride to markup, uh, but I, I'd like to um, give some sense of my interpretation uh, that warrants uh, the uh, passage of this legislation and maybe more work before we go to the floor. Uh, these codes specifically are made by the National Fire Protection Association. This is their intellectual work. Uh, these are standards that are important in making the world safer for everyday citizens and for the firefighters throughout Texas and around the nation. In fact, uh, they rely upon them daily. They have access to them. There is governmental access to this for free. States and cities often use the NFPA's safety standards for many purposes, including through incorporation by reference to protect people and property. And my sense of it is, is that they can open their um, handheld a technology, they can access it in their office. Uh, the NFPA uses rigorous consensus-oriented American National Standards Institute processes to ensure that all interested parties can provide input into developing high-quality standards that evolve as information technology advances around this whole issue of firefighting. And this process is self-funded by the NFPA, meaning industry or other contributions 
cannot and do not influence the process. And that's where I want to rest my argument. Uh, my argument is that the governmental entities do not have to pay. It is copyrighted material. There is an in-depth investment of intellect and review of fire problems so that this organization can come up with the best practices for the architect, the builder, uh, the uh, developer, builder developer, uh, the school district that wants to make sure their schools are safe. They have access uh, to this. The fire marshals have access to this. Uh, and, and therefore, I feel comforted that there is not wrong kind of a wrong-headed influence in this process, which means to keep them standing on their feet and, and current and, and using the greatest technology in minds to make sure we have the best fire standards. We have seen fire death go down in some areas, but we have seen that we still have catastrophic fires. Uh, so it is important to, con to be on the cutting edge. I think my friend from California's concerns uh, should be represented, should have been represented in a hearing, and may be able to be um, uh, entertained as we go to the floor. I always believe that any perfections that can be made should be considered. But I would make the argument that I want a freestanding National Fire Protection Association to provide my firefighters the best information on my fire marshals and the other persons who are in the private sector. I want them to be able to access as well, uh, but a fee to keep the NFPA on its feet, from my perspective, is a worthy investigate, excuse me, um, investment uh, in this. I want to bring to the point of our members that the uh, standards continue to reflect the most up-to-date knowledge and technologies, and NFPA updates its standards every three to five years using a very expensive process, uh, which takes two years to uh, complete. So, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I believe that uh, this is a, a worthy uh, bill uh, for us to, to move, but not without um, taking into concerns of my colleague from California. I, I want to submit into the record um, this letter uh, that was uh, uh, on City of Houston stationery, but it came from Samuel Pena, Fire Chief, City of Houston, Charles Hood, Fire Chief, City of San Antonio, Joe Baker, Fire Chief, City of Austin, uh, and it goes on with other fire chiefs uh, throughout the state of Texas. I ask unanimous consent. Without objection. I'd ask unanimous consent to put into the record the National Association of State Fire Marshals, um, dated July 23, excuse me, July 18, 2023. I ask unanimous consent. Without, without objection. Previous letter was dated July, uh, June 15, 2023, uh, and then uh, two other letters uh, contributing to legislation that we've already looked at. A letter dated July 18, 2023 from the ACLU on the Fourth Amendment, ask unanimous consent. Objection. Uh, and a letter dated uh, June 26, 2022 with uh, organizations like Muslim Justice League, Center for Democracy, Center for Human Rights, Constitutional Lives, and many, many others, uh, ask unanimous consent. Without objection. On the underlying bill, Mr. Chairman, I uh, would support so. moving it forward. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The, the Israeli president speaks at 11. They've asked us to be uh, to try to get to the floor by 10:30. We have four in the queue. I'm, I know some have been waiting, so I'm going to try to get to a few more of you. But we will break at 10:40 so that we can get to the floor for the important address from from the president of Israel. Uh, so next is Mr. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Ivy, Mr. Gates, Ms. Hageman. If I can get to you all, we will. I'll, I'll be very brief. Quickly, I just wanted to note the presence of our esteemed former chairman, Mr. Lamar Smith, the gentleman from oh, Texas. Yes. So he's in the back. Yes. There we go. Thanks for being here, sir. Uh, I just want to yield to Mr. Issa because he has not had enough time, I think, to address some of these concerns. But one question maybe that would get you started. It is a balancing test. I've kind of been with Mr. Bishop on this. I'm a little double-minded. I'm trying to sort it through. Is it true? Someone has, has uh, made this statement, and I wonder if you think it's true. Is it true that Without this copyright protection, the standard setting organizations might be less incentivized or maybe even eventually no longer exist to function in this way and thus provide their valuable subject matter expertise so that in that case, then the government itself then might have to assume that responsibility to create standards without all the subject matter expertise and thus expand its power, which is something that concerns me. What would you say to that? I yield to you. 
Uh, the gentleman's exactly right, that if, if you take away any ability for them to find a revenue that these are nonprofits that, that pays for itself, then they would have to find an alternate way. And, and I think to your point, and, and a point that was made earlier, let's talk about the taking. The fact is that these standard setting organizations could create standards and then say, you can't have them. You go ahead and write your own law, write an original law, we'll just have a standard that we'll, uh, we'll have. And we could have a disconnect between standard setting, which they'd own the copyrights, and it would be best practices, and we'll use something like Underwriters Laboratory as an example, where you, you pay to go through and, and get your product there and get the little seal, completely private. It's not per se codified in law, and yet the government references the underwriters. Many, many uh, places won't carry a product unless you have UL approval, but I gotta tell you, it's not cheap to go through there. That's not a standard we want to have for, for fire. It's the reason that fire marshals and all kinds of organizations who are users of that have been telling us this system works and the partial taking that this bill has, which means forcing them to provide for free access to it, uh, in fact, is consistent with the law. As a matter of fact, Ms. Lofgren cited these earlier cases. These earlier cases were laws created by legislatures that you cannot deny. They are not by reference the way these are, but notwithstanding that, we believe and we've pushed hard in this bill to try to strike a balance, which is there is a partial taking because this has to be available fully online. And quite frankly, for those who have worked with any of this, for a fairly de minimis amount, you can get a, co a, a program and then you can copy and paste and make your insertions. As a matter of fact, those who practice, architects and engineers and builders, they regularly buy this stuff so they can have very organized presentations when they want to argue for a particular what they believe is a compliance, well, somebody maybe downtown at the building uh, organization doesn't. So there are reasons in which you want to have that, but quite frankly, the enhanced capability is, is there if created. It won't be created if we simply steal their copyright, and by the way, the new material won't be created. But I think the, the gentleman has a very, very valid point, and, and I thank him would for yielding some time. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, let me yield to Mr. Gates and then Ms. Ms. Yeah, I, I want to answer your question drawing on my six years in the state legislature. I believe that these standards organizations will draw their revenue as they typically have from their membership. Right? So if you make a widget and you want that widget to be a part of the standard, you have an incentive to join the organization that is going to advocate for that widget to be a part of the standard. And that will be a sufficient incentive structure to continue to get that expertise. And the notion that if these folks can't charge for access to some of the standards they create in some way, that then people in the construction industry, in the fire safety industry are just gonna say, well, we no longer care that the business, that, that we get to participate in the rules that govern the business we're involved in. I, I don't believe that that would, would dissolve. I think that would still exist and the government would still be able to draw on that experience in the absence of the expanded government that would concern my colleague from Louisiana. Would the gentleman have... further yield so uh, I can answer that? Let me let him respond, yeah. The, uh, the reason that fire chiefs and fire councils and firefighters are all supporting this is not because of the widgets. There are widgets in some cases, but in most cases, what we're really talking about, a fire occurs and a standard gets updated to say, you know, you have to have a sprinkler so many feet from such and such, and you need to have a certain amount of pressure. Those kinds of, of analysis of what happens, for example, in a fire safety situation, and the updated code, and the same, by the way, occurs in earthquakes and other uh, construction, those kinds of things don't have a product. They do have associations, but those associations, quite frankly, often would not have the revenue and would have no incentive of creating it. Thank you, I yield gentleman, back. The gentleman yields back, the time of gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. I, I, you know, I, I wanna circle back to Mr. Biggs' original point, which was um, sort of what happened, you know, what led to a problem that needs to be fixed at this point. Um, and as I listened, I think Mr. Fitzgerald said there was a court case that apparently had an impact. Um, I'd like to know more about what that 
or if there, there may be multiple court cases, I'd like to know more about what those courts ruled, what standard came out of them, and what it is we're trying to fix. And then to Mr. Bishop's point, um, I'm also a recovering litigator. Uh, if, if it could be sort of explained in the terms of, because I agree, so the Lexus piece, can't buy the law, you can get the comments and the like. If you have a treatise that's put online, that's a copyrighted document. And so you have the copyright uh, for the document, but also for the comments that Lexis or Westlaw is putting in there. How is this different from that, I guess, is another issue. That I just want to get a sense of what's the problem, what are we trying to fix, and how do we fix it? Because it seemed like apparently it had been working okay. Whatever the, the revenue stream that these entities got for generating these standards had been or, and maybe still is. Maybe they still are working. But something led to this legislation being required. Would, would the, the gentleman, gentleman yield, yield for just a quick answer? Would the gentleman Absolutely. yield? I, I will yield to uh, Mr. Issa first. And, then and I'll Bob. be very brief. You'll find multiple lower courts that, that have ruled that these standards are, that the taking and downloading in bulk was fair use. Uh, that often was reversed, but not without a fight. So that's one of the areas of great concern for these standard setting organizations, because quite frankly, that litigation costs them to protect their own copyright, where normally a copyright holder would absolutely, when they won, get statutory damages and not have to go through this procedure. Would the Ms. Lofgren? Yes, there is a recent decision uh, from 2018, um, in the, and we've entered it into the record. We'll make sure you get a copy of it um, on this very point. In fact, uh, I submitted a, a, an amicus to that as well, where essentially uh, those uh, arguing that you cannot copyright the law uh, prevailed. That was uh, appealed, and most recently in the case of, uh, in 2020 case, Georgia versus Public Resources Org, held that government published material um, is not copyrightable, and it was Justice Roberts who said no one can own the law. We will get you that, a copy of that as well. Um, you have a site for it, Zoe, by any chance? Yeah, this, the district court for the, uh, the appellate court in the District of Columbia and the United States Supreme Court. And we will get copies of both of them for any of the lawyers who want to read them. I yield to Ms. Ross. Thank you. I, I just, again, want to make this just very clear point about whether or not somebody can own the law. The question is, who created the standard in the first place? So when we talk about a court case, that is something that is in the public domain. It's something where everybody can attend. This is a situation where a private organization, privately funded, created a standard. The government then liked the standard and decided to shortcut, not pay to create its own standard, and adopted that. Here, the private organizations are willing to make that available. But if every time the government likes something that a private organization yeah, does it's, it's and codifies it, that's a taking. There is no compensation for every time the government decides that a code, um, a private code, should become, come into the law. And uh, that, I think, is the distinction between owning the law. So, of course, well, but, uh, the look, world just, just should to, see this. Just to reclaim for, for a second, because I'm running out of time. I appreciate that. That's not the issue I had, though. The court case that uh, that I'm referencing was the one that apparently created the issue because the, the 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 approach that you just outlined apparently has been out in place and running for years. So the question is, what's the change that led us to want to put in le le, you know legislation to fix whatever the what? new problem is? Because I'm not clear on what the if, new problem. If the gentleman would further yield, yes, the standards organizations lost in court. And so they've come to Congress because they've lost repeatedly in court. And that's why we're here today. I thank the gentleman for All right, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I know we're running out of time. But I would join in the suggestion that others have made that perhaps a hearing or some kind of additional opportunity to walk through this uh, be provided so that we'd have a chance to go through some of the particulars. Time the gentleman's expired. Uh, I think we've got time for one more, Mr. Gates. We'll try to get to Ms. Hageman, but we may have to. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I associate myself with the sentiment of Mr. Ivey that on a matter of this complexity, where I do think Mr. Bishop, Mr. Johnson, and others are trying to strike an appropriate balance that 
a more fulsome review of where to find this line might guide us to a, a bipartisan landing zone. But when I'm confused, I tend to be the flavor of populist who thinks that the populist should have access to the law uh, without having to pay even a de minimis amount. And there are a few reasons why. Like, in, in the most extreme, like, what, what are we going to hear next? Road builders saying that you've got to pay to know what the speed limit is so that we can fund more roads? I mean, that would be the absurd extreme on one side. And then I also don't think that just because an organization collaborates with the government that every thought they've ever had, every work product they've ever had, every manual they've ever had is all of a sudden in the public domain. So I, I do think that, that there is a balance, but I strongly uh, reject the premise of the legislation that in the absence of these organizations being able to maintain a property interest that they can externally financially exploit, that they will just dissolve and cease to exist and have, have no interest anymore. And as we've been in discussions among colleagues, uh, someone asked me reasonably, well, a bunch of firefighters are different than a bunch of contractors. So if some firefighters came up with something that was a good standard for fire suppression, then we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't want uh, them to be subject to the same lens that we would have someone that created a hurricane tie down that they wanted in the state of Florida to be part of the building code. But I think that that requires us to zoom out a bit. The whole premise for why something ought to be in a code or a law is because there is some public good. There is some public imp import to that. And the point that my colleague from California, Ms. Lofgren, made earlier that I would like to uh, to double stomp is the notion that proliferating these codes and ideas actually can yield better public policy through clash and uh, discourse and debate and review and questioning and whether that's the latest sinkhole technology or fire suppression, you know, I I'm reticent to support legislation that I think could be limiting of that type of, of collaboration, particularly on matters as important as like whether people are gonna live or die in a fire, or whether or not when an earthquake hits, people are going to be safe as a consequence of, of the building codes. Um, and I also worry about the litigation that this bill could spur that we're not thinking about. We've had some discussion of the litigation that brought us to this point, but in a world post this bill, could you be in an environment where, where people believed that they were engaging in you know, putting on a seminar about building codes or about fire suppression, and they start using things that then they're getting hammered in some intellectual property <laughs> context for. So while, while this is complicated, what, and what I think the public needs to understand observing this debate is, the purpose of the bill is to maintain within a standard organization an L, a property right that the courts have said they do not have. Correct. And it is to maintain that property right to personally, to, to, to financially exploit it. Th that is, I think, the premise, but well, I, would, I would yield to the gentlelady from California. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. I think you know, it's uh, not correct uh, that these uh, various standard settings groups would uh, fall apart absent charging the public for finding out about the law. For example, the American Society for Testing and Materials uh, in uh, 20, let's see, I'm gonna get the right. Around, right? They had, uh, and their executive was compensated $4,500,000. Their revenue was over 100 million, and it was made up of um, uh, their manuals, training documents, other materials. Um, yeah, we seem to be in the wrong business, Mr. Lofgren, but I'm going to reclaim my time to yield it to Mr. Madison. So, so what are standards? Standards are things that are in common use. Like, and let's just take an example. You might be able to copyright the format of your font and the arrangement of things, but you can't copyright the rise and run of a pipe for proper drainage in your plumbing, plumbing system. A quarter inch per inch shouldn't be copyrightable to start with. That's a notion. These are physics, these standards are, and they're in common use. So... I think you do get to own the fonts and the, and the charts and the graphs and all that, but you can't own the concept as it goes into law. This isn't the weaponization of government, but this is the monetization of legislation. <laughs> in my opinion, I yield back. Gentlemen, yield back. Gentlemen yields back. We will stand in recess until approximately 15 minutes after the president's remarks, and then we will be back uh, as quickly as we can.